Very good to go. Okay, may I start? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I, uh, I'm Tetsuya from Urban Core. Uh, this paper uh, proposes a method to train a model under the small data set. Uh, so as you know, uh, most of the uh, deep learning based uh, image processing system uh, requires a, a huge size of uh, data set as a training. Uh, however, uh, correction of the data set uh, 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 requires a very uh, high cost and a very long time. And, uh, However, uh, business side uh, always requires a, a quick POC for, the, uh, for these models, so that is a gap. So we uh, propose the, uh, the method uh, to train a model under the small data set. So uh, the, uh, uh, the key idea is very simple in our paper. Uh, so we can use conditional gain uh, for, uh, for leveraging the efficiency of the data set. So here uh, is a sketch of our proposed architecture. So this architecture can be uh, uh, can be divided to two parts. Uh, one is the uh, uh, training of the target model, T, and another is uh, uh, conditional GAN. Uh, the purpose of the target model is to do the uh, target task like uh, classification or regression. And the role of the conditional GAN uh, is to uh, generate a good fake images uh, that matches with uh, a given condition, given labels. And, uh, uh, we train uh, these two parts uh, at the same time uh, because uh, the signals uh, from the target model is very useful for the training of the uh, conditional GAN. Uh, precisely saying uh, the loss function, uh, loss value uh, from the target model uh, contains a, a classification or a regression result of the fake images. And that is quite useful for the training of the generator of the conditional GAN because um, yeah, uh, it helps to generate the good images that matches with the uh, uh, given uh, label. And from the viewpoint uh, of the comparison with the previous works, uh, in our architecture, uh, the target model and discriminator is perfectly separated. Uh, in other words, uh, in the previous work, uh, target model uh, plays a role for both, both target model and uh, uh, a discriminator. Uh, we think uh, it's better to separate uh, because uh, in, in our architecture, uh, target model can focus on the target task uh, like regression or uh, classification and not necessary to worry about the discrimination task. Okay, so here is a, a, a numerical example of our architecture. And, uh, 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 this figure is the result on a CIFR-10 dataset, a very famous classification dataset. And the uh, uh, horizontal axis is the uh, number of images per class, and the uh, uh, vertical axis is uh, uh, the classification accuracy. And this yellow curve uh, is our, uh, as a result of our architecture and others our previous works. As you can see, uh, uh, the right end uh, of this figure uh, is uh, 1,000 images per class that correspond to 20% uh, of the original dataset. And uh, uh, our architecture uh, shows a uh, not bad uh, performance, uh, even if uh, the dataset is reduced to 20%. Uh, and also, uh, it shows a better performance than the previous works. And uh, 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 the, uh, we can see the same tendencies uh, with the other dataset like C400 uh, and uh, SVHN. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, we propose a, a method to train a model under the small dataset. And uh, we think uh, this uh, architecture is applicable for simple tasks like uh, classification or regression. Uh, however, uh, not be able to uh, apply for a more complicated tasks like uh, detection of the facial landmarks or uh, a human pose or like that, because uh, conditional GAN uh, may not be able to generate good images that matches with the label. So uh, for doing that, uh, we need uh, yeah, some additional uh, a trick like a surrogate model or something for supporting a conditional GAN. Uh, that is our future work. That's all from me. Thank you.
Uh, what, how long have people typically been uh, using? This is really just take your time. Okay. Okay, and can I wait? I have more question. Is it if I mess up the first time, can you do a retake? It's live. It's live. <laughs> uh, wait, 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 it's live right now? Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay, turn it off so I can ask. Uh, my name is Tony Zhang. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan in the United States of America. I'm currently doing uh, research in various applications, environmental applications, such as, air, air, such as specifically in air quality. I'm currently doing, I currently perform work in image-based air quality forecasting using multi-level attention. We were able to incorporate both spatial attention and feature attention to improve accuracy in forecasting. This is also significant because images, fusing both images and uh, air quality data is, um, is, is a lot less um, expensive because cameras are statistically 10 times, 10 times to 100 times uh, less expensive than a monitoring station which collects PM2.5 data. Overall, the architecture I constructed led to improving accuracy by 50.8% a root mean square error, and uh, overall we've demonstrated that uh, uh, we were able to improve accuracy by using um, a, a data fusion architecture, and we also show that why our attention mechanism works. Thank you very much. So just, just presenting?
So, uh, hello, I'm Jamin Park from Dongguk University in Korea. So, uh, my research is histogram based transformation function estimation for low light image enhancement. Uh, my, uh, the, uh, how to say, the contribution of my research is that. Uh, my, my algorithm is output the transformation function first and using the intensity transformation so uh, we can generate the enhanced image like this but uh, most of the conventional algorithms are output the enhanced image from the network directly so if we use our algorithm we can analyze the enhancement process by analyzing the transformation function like this. So uh, my algorithm is uh, like this. So first the uh, AFC uh, fuse the attention image and input image. So we can generate the channel, channel wise uh, brightness uh, image. So at the SFC uh, extract the image feature like this and the key point of our algorithm is RHA. So RHA exploit the histogram to facilita facilitate the statistical proper properties like this. So it means that the extracted image feature from here and the histogram here, oh, we extract the histogram feature using the SFHC blocks. This is the extended version of SFC block like this. And using the extracted histogram feature, we concatenate it. The, we concatenate the histogram feature and image feature like this. And we generate the attention feature like this. And using the residual attention mechanism or we generate F RHA feature here. So and the uh, three fully connected layer and hyperbolic tangent activation function finally we can generate the histogram function like this. And using the intensity transformation function or we can generate we can obtain the enhanced image like this. And we use Four loss functions. Uh, first is the image loss to uh, to compute the MSC loss, and color similarity loss is uh, is preserve color similarity loss preserve the uh, color similarity. I mean, it 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 is based on the cosine similarity and transformation function loss just compute the L1 norm between uh, ground truth transformation function and the estimated transformation function. And monotonicity loss uh, make the transformation function uh, monotonically increasing. And in the experimental research, uh, our Algorithm achieved the highest performance between the among the conventional algorithms, and the proposed algorithm uh, qualitative, qualitatively uh, shows the uh, good result like this, and the effectiveness of input histogram using RHA block. Uh, we can see the RHA block is effectiveness. To, to generate the uh, enhanced image. So, yeah, thank you.
Uh, we experience a degradation phenomenon, which we can see a darker than it really the image is. To solve the problem, we propose the framework above. The first framework we uh, we generate the pseudo GT generation uh, with using the deep learning method. In this part, we don't need the reference image because we are training through to the self-supervised learning. And second, we generate the global contrast enhancement method. On this method, we uh, generate a piecewise linear enhancement curve, which is we call the PLEC. Because uh, the curve uh, transforms, we, we, have to, uh, we can generate very fastly with hardware friendly, like such as uh, do, uh, compared to the uh, previous methods, we can generate much as fast as 0 0.097. And third, uh, when, we, uh, when we enhance with global contrast enhancement, we can lose details because it's for gamma correction. To restore the local details, uh, we blending with uh, a conventional contrast enhancement method. So as a result, when we simulate the degradation phenomenon at each part, we can show the best visibility due to, uh, compared, to, uh, compared to related method. Thank you. Hello, I'm Yoshiaki Ueda from Fukuoka University, Japan. In this poster presentation, I'll talk about fusion-based backlit image enhancement using multiple S-type transformations for convex combination questions. At first, I'll explain about backlit images. Backlit images is a picture which taken under backlit condition. Backlit images contain a very bright region and very dark region. Okay. <clears throat> so these, these regions have the visibility of such region is very low. So in this, in this research, to improving the visibility of such images, so around here, around here, is very, very important. And uh, <clears throat> in our method, we realize the enhancement of the, these images. So typically, uh, general image enhancement methods are used for these images. And um, backlit image enhancement methods are used. However, these methods are applied to intensity component. On the other hand, our method, uh, our method applies the uh, intensity and uh, saturation component. And uh, our method realizes enhancement of intensity contrast in dark and bright regions and uh, realizes global and local contrast enhancement. At the uh, before, before I explain about proposed method, I'll explain about the pixel representation by the convex combination. So the pixel X is represented by the ratio of white, black, and its pure color. Okay, the inner point of X is represented by its combina convex combination of this equation. Here, W is white. K is black and C is pure color. And these coefficients are calculated by this simple equa equation. The, the triangular shaped plane 
is the constant hue plane. So the, the pixels on this plane has the same hue. For, for, um, to, to explain the pixel by using this equation, we can, we can see that the X is the mixture of the white, black, and pure color. And these questions are these uh, has these constraints. Okay, and uh, the pixel X is uh, located at the in uh, at in the triangle, and black pixel nearby here, and white pixels are nearby here, and pure color and uh, colorful pixel is uh, in uh, in the top of the triangle. Okay. And uh, okay, so we use this uh, convex combination. So <coughs> I explain the proposed method. Uh, in the input image is here, and all pixels are transformed into this, this triangle. And the pixel distribution of the input image is uh, like that. So then uh, I'd like to enhance the image. So uh, these points, um, so these points are represented by this equation. These coefficients are transformed by using this S-type transformation. By using S-type transformation, so the, the pixel distribution of the, like this, and uh, after S-type transformation, the pixel distribution is transformed like that. So we compare the, these images. Uh, the output image becomes very bright and colorful. And uh, furthermore, the, uh, we, we apply by using other parameters. So the image becomes transformed into very, very bright. Okay, so by using, uh, by changing the parameters of these coefs, uh, by the, this trend, uh, uh, by, by changing the parameters of the curve, so we generate many types of images like that. Finally, uh, our method fuses fuse the, these images. We, we can generate the bright and colorful and uh, very good visibility images are generated. All these, uh, are, these are resultant images of, uh, of the conventional and our proposed method. And furthermore, the quantitative metrics are these here. Our method is based on the tone curve based method. So the, the metrics of LOE uh, this is the uh, lightness order error is uh, very very good result and uh, the contrast is improved by uh, compared with the proposed method. Furthermore, the <coughs> uh, naturalness of the image uh, is slightly uh, improved, but other methods are more, more good results. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, my.
Ready? Okay. So this is an old-fashioned paper. It doesn't involve deep learning. And uh, the core idea is to perform view synthesis based on uh, depth and uh, RGB images. So um, more than that, the whole motivation is to explore temporal coherence in the video sequence. And then you can build a background model uh, to improve the stability, the stability of the uh, synthesis step. So initially, you have a set of training frames, assuming a static camera. You have the corresponding RGB and depth images. And then you, you basically, we, we explore an existing approach for background uh, subtraction, background modeling, which basically computes the alpha trimmed mean of the input sequences to remove outliers and moving objects. And we also retrieve the points with the, uh, the smallest disparity, which relates to the largest depth, which is characterize the background. And we also compute a ghost map. So what's a ghost map? In the boundaries of the depth map, usually you have uncertainty when uh, projecting relating depth and color values and that might reproject in the synthesis process one foreground back, uh, pixel to the background or vice versa. So the idea is to build this ghost map and then ignore this in the background modeling and then deal with that later in the synthesis itself. So. I'm not getting into details on the algorithm, but the whole idea is that we start with the, the initial model. As you can see here, the dancer uh, wasn't, uh, was roughly in the same position in the first frames, so you cannot obtain the, 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 the real background, which is the, uh, the wall around her, behind her. Uh, while she moves around the scene, this wall gets disoccluded, which means that you can see objects with a smaller disparity and then you incorporate these objects into the background model as well as the, the disparity values. So basically that's the, 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 the math, the algorithm that does this process, the update model. We have a confidence factor which uh, basically measures how stable a point is. So if you have a region that's, that keeps stable, you increase the confidence and then you decrease the weight of that, 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 that point when you uh, update the model. So the final step, once you have a background model, you have the RGB and depth, you can plug and play any depth image based rendering uh, algorithm. So in this work, we explored our previous work, which is based on hierarchical superpixels. And our motivation for using this superpixel-based approach, it was proposed for still frames. And here we adapt it for video sequences, is that when using a superpixel segmentation, it's easier to map uh, one projected pixel when you do the interpolation process. When you place the virtual camera, you can use the super pixel coherence to uh, place it into a given region or another one. So in terms of results, this is the frame by frame PSNR and SSIC metrics computed for, uh, let me see how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight data sets. Uh, in terms of PSNR and SSIM, we get, uh, I am, we get the best results in four out of eight, which is, well, maybe not that impressive, but the main goal here is not to improve the frame-by-frame -frame accuracy, but to, to improve the, the smoothness, the temporal smoothness. To evaluate te temporal smoothness, we also considered um, a quality, video quality metric which is focused on capturing temporal consistency, which is STR 
RID. And using this metric, we can get the best results in six out of eight approaches. Uh, here we show relative values. Uh, we normalize all the techniques, the competitive techniques, by the smallest value. Since we do not have a standardized uh, and an intuitive evaluation of the STR red, unlike the PSNR and SSICM, where usually people can, can relate the number to a given quality. So we have some visual results here. Uh, these pixels in white are pixel, pixels that are either related to ghosts or uh, larger regions where the new camera location were occluded. And in the bottom, we have the results of um, different approaches. So basically, that's it. In terms of running times, it's, it's, it's not exactly real time, but for offline processing, it works pretty well. OK, thank you. Good morning, I'm Pawan. I'll be presenting my recent work focusing on revisiting dead leaves model using synthetic data. So in this work, we focus on the problem of stereo disparity estimation, where the goal, where the input is two images, and the goal is to estimate the depth using these two images. When we consider the current existing models, most of them are supervised deep neural networks which require large amount of data in order to achieve superior performance. However, when we consider the problem of stereo disparity estimation, the main challenge here is to obtain large-scale realistic data sets since stereo data sets require capturing two images simultaneously and also capturing the depth at the same time. So since, these, since the capturing of these large realistic data sets for stereo disparity is challenging, we experiment with whether is it possible to come up with a synthetic model, come up with a model which can generate synthetic data that can be used to train deep networks and also realize well on realistic data sets. So the main goal here is to obtain synthetic data using natural image statistics and use this model to evaluate on the realistic data. So we propose what is known as the dead leaves model. So Deadleaf's model is basically constructed using a three-dimensional space where the three-dimensional space is filled with colored spheres with, which are, with radii sampled from the distribution shown over here. And once we construct the 3D space as shown over here, we project them onto two different cameras and the left one corresponds to the left image and the right one corresponds to the right image. Since we already have access to this three-dimensional space, we also have access to the the ground truth, which is the depth data here, and the entire training data is obtained as shown over here. We have the left image, the right image, and the corresponding ground truth. The main motivation of using this dead leaves model is that when we observe the statistics of the construct of the generated images, they resemble very close to that of natural images as shown over here. In the sense that when we train a model you, which, which is purely trained using synthetic data, the goal is that is it, it is possible to generalize well on realistic data. And once we have obtained all this training data using this dead leaves model, we train the existing state of the art stereo disparity estimation networks and predict the and evaluate on the realistic data. And we show the some of the results over here where a realistic image is given as input and we compare it with existing state of the art models. And we observe that the, the performance of the model, which is exclusively trained on synthetic data, uh, generalizes well on realistic data as well. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, our project about is about uh, using drones as a base station, and uh, we try to predict uh, the path loss distribution in a given geographical area using deep learning. And the, the ultimate goal here is to uh, find the coverage, predict the coverage provided by the base station, and then optimize the height of the drone. So we collect uh, path loss values at different heights of the drone, and we simulate the path loss in wireless inside software. We have the 3D models of the area, and wireless insight gives us uh, the receiver path loss on a uniform grid, uh, 110 by 110 grid in an area. So we provide a path loss heat map for the given geographical area. And with this path loss heat map, we have the ground truth path loss distribution. So the path loss distribution is shown here. And we use this uh, ground truth data to train our model. Our deep learning model is a, a regression network, a VGG network. The input is the 2D satellite image of the area. And the output are the histogram values at four different heights. Basically, the heights are uh, 40 meter, 80 meter, 120 meter, and 300 meter for the drone. And we have the histograms at four different heights, and we uh, basically estimate the histograms at these heights. And in the end, uh, the predicted histograms are pretty close to the ground truth histograms. And the mean square error for the prediction is also quite accurate and better than our previous work. Also compared to the analytical models in the literature, like free space and Okumara Hata models, uh, the histograms are significantly more accurate. And you can use these histograms, predicted histograms, to estimate the coverage uh, in the given area and optimize the drone height. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, good morning. This is a work on <clears throat> bimodal compositions. So these in disentangles the state and the object. For example, uh, if we have training samples as ripe banana or peeled apple, can we recognize a peeled banana? So peeled banana is not there in the training set, but can we do that from ripe banana and peeled apple, a combination of that? Right. So we build an architecture optimizing three losses. The losses are state feature loss, object feature loss and a combination of that. Now this combination of state and object penalizes impossible combinations. For example, you cannot have a ripe laptop or a cracked apple, right? So penalize it 
right at the middle and these three loss in combination gives me the optimized architecture of this uh, proposed system. In the architecture part, the one that needs to be highlighted is there are word embedding features and then there are image features. So these word features and image features are combined and optimized by optimizing these loss functions. Um, we have worked on these uh, for two data sets. One is the MIT States database and another is the UT ZAP data, data set and we get a uh, relatively good results uh, for our combinations. We have also shown that these features of states and objects can be disentangled to a certain extent and gives a, a, a good visualization of the system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So in this work, we are mainly upscaling the light fill images by using single image super resolution model. So there are a lot of research has been done in single image super resolution domain. So there are a lot of pretend models are available. So we are using those models to upscale the light fill images. So um, before before our work, there are those works which which has developed the highly engineered architecture for light fill images. But uh, we are using the any single image super resolution model means like RDN and DSR and we insert one adaptation module to perform the light field image upscaling. So any single image upscaling model can be divided into two parts. One is feature extraction and the other one is upscaling. So in our case, we fix the pretend weights of those two models and we insert one adaptation module and update the weights only of this adaptation module. So this is our proposed adaptation module. In the adaptation module, suppose we want to upscale this center image so if i is that image and we extract the features from other images so f1 f2 and fn are features from other images means this here the, we extract the features here so those features from other images and we fuse those features with fi and this is the modulated features fi dash so this is fi and here this is fi dash and we can observe that these adaptation modules and by exploiting the features from other images improves the performance which can see, can be seen here this is without without adaptation module and this is with adaptation module and these are the adaptation these are the uh, uh, ablation study of our adaptation module so here we can see that if we don't use our, our adaptation module so the PSN is 34.1 suppose we then we use the adaptation module, the PSN improves, but it improves only 0.07 dB. But the main key features of the adaptation module is the difference features in the SAS block. So these difference features, when we add those difference features and give it to the SAS block, it improves the performance almost 0.6 dB. And also we can observe that if we increase the angular in resolution means angular, when we increase the angular resolution, it, it also increases the angular information present in those images. So it also improves the performance a lot. So this, this table is the quantitative evolution of our approaches as compared to the recent benchmarks. And these are the visual performance of our method. So, yes.
skills. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, Dijda Han Ulucan and uh, I'm a PhD student under the supervision of uh, Professor Mark Ebner at the uh, University of Greifswald. And in this work, uh, we introduce a novel intrinsic mixture composition data set. It's a synthetic large scale data set. Um, intrinsic images are uh, low level features of scenes uh, that can be uh, represented individually. Uh, usually, uh, Intrinsic image decomposition algorithms take into account the reflectance and shading components to simplify this impulse problem. However, it is known that obtaining the most possible information from an input is important. And uh, to obtain this um, information, we need ground truth data. But in the uh, existing intrinsic image decomposition data sets, there are certain shortcomings. And uh, but we take these shortcomings into account and create IID nodes. And in IID node, we have 128,000 scenes. And for each scene, we uh, provide five different intrinsic images. The reflectance, normal vectors, depth map shading, and light vectors are provided for each scene. Uh, we use a high number of 3D assets, different textures, viewing angles, and illumination conditions. Uh, we use different types of layouts for uh, especially the depth maps to avoid bias in learning-based methods. Also, we use different illumination types, uh, which have not been considered in intrinsic image decomposition before. Uh, we use different viewing angles, uh, random object placement uh, in our scenes, and uh, we show the usability of IID node by um, using four different intrinsic image decomposition algorithms. Uh, this is a, a, the, one is optimization based, one is neural network based, uh, one is uh, an algorithm that takes into account an input stack. And one is actually a low light enhancement method, which uses intrinsic image decomposition in its pipeline. Uh, we see that uh, IID not challenges the intrinsic image decomposition algorithms by also allowing for proper decomposition. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, hello, my name is Osman Ulucan and I'm a PhD student and research assistant at uh, University of Greifswald under the supervision of Professor Dr. Mark Ebner. We are working in the fields of color constancy, color illusion perception, and image formation. So in this study, we try to stress out that data sets and learning based methods do not include the illuminance. Uh, values outside the color temperature curve, uh, which means that uh, these data sets do not consider very strong greenish, purplish, and reddish illumination conditions. And our study is the first study uh, pointing out that stress uh, problem. And uh, we also introduced a novel uh, color constancy algorithm. Uh, our color constancy algorithm is based on the assumptions that Grayworth and Max RGB. Uh, since uh, human visual system might be discounting the illuminant based on space average color and highest luminance patch. Uh, so we assume that there are several bright pixels in the scene and, we're, uh, and the world is gray on average. Our main idea is that if there is a shift from that gray value, it should be caused by the illumination condition. Uh, so we take uh, input image and we uh, divide input image into non-overlapping blocks. Then for each block, we are looking for the bright pixel, which can be easily found by taking the maximum response of uh, that uh, block. Then uh, we calculate a gray value, which is a scalar value, and we look the deviation uh, from that gray value by solving this optimization problem. And then we estimate the uh, illumination, global illumination, by taking the mean of the each uh, estimates. Uh, we want to further modify our algorithm, uh, since its performance is state of the art and we want to further it more for multi-illuminant scenes. So, thank you.
Is it is it live or? Ah, yeah. May I start? Well, hello. My name is Jaime Gallego. I work in the Event Lab as a researcher. And in this paper, we present the 3D object reconstruction using frontal images, and we apply it to uh, the guitar reconstruction. So our objective here is to obtain automatic 3D construction of objects using frontal RGB images. So current state of the art use neural networks in order to obtain the 3D reconstruction. So what is the problem? Or one of the problems is that in order to fit the neural network and to train the neural network, you need a lot of data, 3D models, in order to train this network and obtain from a photo of the object the 3D construction. And current state of the arts go in this direction. What we propose here is, okay, we have a lot of information from 3D templates that you can download from internet, and why not, by using a frontal image of the object, try to solve the hidden parts of the object by using the information from the templates. So in this way, we have designed first a chain of image processing methods where we first segment, in this case, the guitar. We detect if the guitar is frontal enough to be reconstructed. We also detect the type of guitar. In this case, we use Spanish and electric guitars. And finally, we apply a segmentation of the regions in order to correctly adapt the regions of the object that we want to segment into the template. So in order to perform all these image processing techniques, we use neural networks, but in 2D. First, we apply a guitar non-guitar segmentation. We develop a, a, a database using 2,200 RGB images of guitars that are segmented. We segment manually the guitars, and we use ResNet50 in order to obtain well, ResNet50 PG and segmentation in order to obtain this segmentation. Then the classifiers about frontal, non-frontal, guitar, electric, or Spanish, we use ResNet50 network in order to perform the segmentation. And the final segmentation, as well, we use uh, the PGN segmentation model that is similar to a Deep, Deep, uh, Deep Lab V3 Plus uh, segmentation. Once we have the segmentation, the key point is to obtain the 3D reconstruction. So we align the photo, the segmentation of the object, with the template that we have. And once we have this alignment done, we apply what is called boundary matching. So the contour of the template is aligned, is, is associated to the contour of the real object that we want to, to reconstruct. So each pixel of the contour has its contour part in the template. Once we have this correspondence, we can apply this warping. We warp the template model. We can see here an example of the templates. The template model of the family of the object that we want to reconstruct to the real shape of the object. So, we have this correspondence, we apply the warping using mean value coordinates to work the depth and the normal maps. So that we have a mesh of the frontal part of the object. Okay, and with this, this mesh, we can, since this mesh is exactly the same as the object that we want to segment, to reconstruct, we can project directly the texture. So we have kind of photorealistic, we can call, it's not exactly photorealistic, but kind of photorealistic uh, reconstruction of the frontal part of the object. Then the back side of the object is reconstructed using the information of the template. And we adapt both according to the template information, according to the depth of the template. Once we have both parts, the frontal and the back side of the object, we can apply an stitching. And finally, the texture of the back part is, apply, is obtained applying in painting techniques. Okay? So finally, what are the results that we obtain? You can observe here. For electric guitar, in this case, we get up the, the template of the electric guitar to the shape of the guitar that we detect, segment the regions, and the final result that we obtain. And it's exactly the same with the Spanish guitar, where we obtain a kind of photorealistic guitar, a reconstruction of the guitar that we want to obtain. In order to obtain the numerical results, we use the same methodology to reconstruct cars and airplanes. And we use a database in order to have the ground truth. The results that you can observe, numerical results, are here. And our method obtains similar results and even better than current state-of-the-art methods. And the good part is that we also obtain the texture. Some of these methods 
uh, don't deal with the texture, just with the shape of the object reconstructed in 3D. In our case, we also project the texture into the model and we have a final reconstructed object that can be used in virtual reality. That is our main objective. Just the last, uh, finally, to, to, to finish this, uh, this presentation, just say that another good, uh, good part of this implementation is that if the template has a property, imagine that the guitar has a, the template of the guitar has a property in virtual reality that you can play the guitar, for instance, okay? and it sounds some music, or the car has a door that can be open, okay? These properties are preserved in this process, so that your object that will be photorealistic according to the photo will have this property also in virtual reality, and you will be able to use it in kind of a metaverse, okay? And that's all, that's all about the, the presentation of, of this paper. Thank you. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs>and we want we get an output where we give we complete information here. So <coughs> our work is focused on the two issues. First issue is the initial input is always with the depth noise here, such you can see here. So so the second issue is we want to focus on the larger area of the missing value. Oh, uh, which is about 25% of 25% of like, the whole day image. So you can see our our model results in this column, yeah. And uh, the baseline model the result is from this column. And you can see these two kinds. Is, uh, first first object is a trash can, and second object is a monitor. You can see the result in the baseline here. <laughs> The baseline is always filling with uh, like the background value. This is the first one, one value here. And uh, also, you can see the flat area of the monitor. They will, <coughs> well, you can see the, the filling result is always with the noise. So look at our result here. You can see our result is more clearly than the original result, especially in the edge area. So the monitor result will be more smooth in the flat area. So this is our point cloud result is transformed from the depth intensity. So you can see the noise is just like this and the more smooth or flat is just like this.
So first we talk about our input method. The input method is based on the sequential depth. This sequential depth means, means the, we input the initial depth and we slice into 64 channels based on this formula. This formula, we will get uh, just like this kind of feature here. And after that, we will group each group, every edge channel into the one group. And, and, and after that, we will collect this group in, fit into the COM LST and, and generate the, the first of all input features here. And then we will fit the input feature into the, the depth filter, which means love them. Uh, encoder decoder model to fill in the depth value is is meant in the this kind of model and all the output the output information is about the residual fill in residual information here we will add this original original feature into here and add them into predict the final predicted sequence and this kind of sequence we will use the uh, the loss constraints called the sequence loss, and after that we sum all of the each channel into a one final predict image. This image will we get the complete depth information, and we use the enhancement loss called the EA loss. Then EA loss here we show here the edge awareness loss. We use the normal map come from the come from the raw depth image. For depth imagery, directly use the normal estimation to transform the, normal, the depth image into a normal image and without any learnable model. <coughs> so you can see if we choose the different x direction gradient to the normal map, we will get the control penalty here. And we will this so oh, after that, we will so see this kind of loss will focus on the focus on the edge area inform to, to fill in depth information. And the final contribution here, we use the sequence loss. This sequence loss, we, how we do this se sequence loss is just like uh, initial input is, the, is with the egg group channel. Egg group channels here, but we want to keep the accuracy of the ground truth we must slice the true data into 256 channels based on the intensity range is from little to 255. So after that, we also group in the, each kind of channel to like this one. We will map with each other and, using the, and use the L1 known to calculate the sequence loss. <coughs> so this is all. Uh, all our contribution here, and uh, you can show uh, we show the evaluated result here, <coughs> and <coughs> this evaluation is based on the constant window size we scan over the whole whole predicted image, and then calculate the <coughs> the IMS and SSIM here based on the region. The facial region is uh, one over four of the the window size. So we can see the result here is more significant, significantly than you just look at the whole depth image. Yes. So, and then, then this part is another, another visualized image here. Together. So thank you. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you.
good morning this is a presentation on self supervised learning for texture classification we consider a uh, realistic uh, industrial uh, use case wherein we have large unlabeled data but with limited labeling capacity we propose two new ideas in this work the first is you to use the part to hold pretext task wherein we take a random crop of the whole image and apply different data augmentations and this must still be similar to the original source image because they belong to the same texture the second idea is to use multi gap features that is multiple global average pooling features wherein instead of taking only the last convolutional layer we extract features from all the convolutional layers and concatenate them together these two ideas are used in the simclr framework that is based on similarity of contrastive loss if we take a source image and apply different data augmentations these two must be similar to each other whereas if we sample negatives for example if we have a batch of size n we sample negatives of 2 n to n minus 1 negative pairs which must be dissimilar to each other so this is the framework wherein we use part to hold simclr pretext task in order to do fine grain texture classification we have demonstrated this on a data set called ground terrain outdoor scenes which consists of 40 texture classes and you can observe that um, some of the classes are very similar to each other this is basically the workflow wherein we take the unlabeled data set and uh, perform ssl training and do multi gap feature extraction and in order to demonstrate how well the method works on uh, fine grain texture classification we use 50% of the training labels and we show that it is uh, uh, very comparable in performance when compared to using 100% of the training labels this has several industrial applications such as track and trace in manufacturing counterfeit detection satellite imagery and microscopic image classification thank you Yeah, sure, sure. Is it working? Okay. When you say I can start. Okay. In our approach we are focused on the hard example mining. In literature, the hard example mining mostly used in a class imbalance problem. For example, when there's a 100 pedestrians and 10 cars in your example data sets, you may get worse results on the detection of the cars. But in our example, we, are, we, don't, we only have one class problem and the problem is our class is, contains very small UAVs 
and they are hard to detect because of the background foreground problem. So in order to solve that, we have implemented the VRU's two existing hard example mining approaches. We adapt them and combine the state of the art object detector. And first one of them is the focal loss. Originally, focal loss is implemented with the something like that with a gamma parameter and with the help of that the higher loss values become higher and the low loss values small loss values are becoming smaller in comparison in our case this is a problem because the objectness loss value is becoming relatively small than the overall loss function and to solve that we have added an additional balancing parameter and in overall loss function, we are basically multiplying the ob objectness loss value so that the objectness loss and the box regression loss are comparable with each other and it works well. And the second uh, approach, the second approach we have used is the loss rank mining. It works like that. For example, we have a sample image in YOLO. This sample image is divided into cells. And for each cell, we apply the firstly balanced focal loss. After them, we flatten the each image sample, and then we sort the loss values. All of the cells contains the loss values now, and we sort them. And the loss rank mining comes up here. It takes the top B proportion of the number of cells for each image sample, so that we can use the top highest B proportion of the examples and trash the rest of them. And finally we take the mean and we get our final object loss. And after that, in order to check if it is really considering the hardest hard examples or not, we are we have done an ablation study. We have compared the pair method pairs by the using them in true, true positive false negative pairs. For example, whenever the first method gives a true positive and the second method gives a false negative, we say that this example is a hard example and first method is working better than the second method on that hard example. And we have experimented with all these images in our data sets and we found out that our combined approach, the balanced focal loss and loss rank mining approach is works better than the other combinations. And lastly, we have verified our results with the original object detection metrics. And we see that our combined approach to outperforms the default YOLO loss function by around 3%. So that's all. Thank you.
Which is great. All right, so I'm already talking to people? Yes. All right. Okay, so hi everyone. So this is my work. It is called Fast Learning from Label Proportions with Small Bags. I'm not sure if any one of you worked with some kind of weak labeling. So let me just first uh, give you an idea what we work with. So uh, this here, it illustrates the standard supervised learning. So we have some instances denoted by the blue balls and uh, each of the instances is labeled either uh, positive green or negative red. So what we work, work with is something called learning from label proportions. So in that case, the instances are uh, grouped in something which we call bags. And uh, we are not provided with individual instance labels. They are hidden, but we are provided with back labels. And the back labels give us uh, the number of positive instances in each bag. So for example, here, we know that in this bag there is one positive instance and one negative instance, but we are not sure which is which. So either this is positive and this is negative, or this is positive and this is negative. And also, we are also focusing on some, uh, on a special kind of, uh, on particular case of LLP, where the bag sizes are very small. So it is like one through 12 instances per bag. And this assumption allows us to generate for each bag to generate the set of possible labelings. So for example, as I said here, the possible labelings are positive negative or negative positive. And uh, this leads to this a posterior distribution where y is the number of positive instances as, and x is the collection of all instances. You can uh, imagine it being a sequence of images, for example. So this, this a posterior distribution turns out to be Poisson binomial distribution, which is just the sum of probabilities of all individual labelings. And uh, this probability of one labeling amounts to this product over all individual hidden instance labels conditioned on the uh, instances, individual instances. And we decided to model this, this uh, probability using a deep neural network. So uh, imagine a ResNet with sigmoid activation or VGG, whatever. And then, so we were thinking how, how to train this kind of model. So uh, we went with the log likelihood maximization. And uh, for us, the log likelihood reads as this expression. So it is kind of an ugly expression. So there's logarithm of some uh, you can say huge sum, and each of the summons is a product like this. So it would be difficult to optimize. So we went with the expectation maximization approach, which means to introduce these auxiliary variables. The important thing is that all the variables for each bag and each configuration is greater or equal to zero, so it's non-negative. And for each particular bag J, when you sum over the alpha variables, it goes to zero, uh, I'm sorry, it goes to one. So uh, this allows us to claim that this auxiliary expression is a lower bound of the original objective. So that way, when we optimize the uh, lower bound, we kind of optimize even the original objective. So the M algorithm consists of two, uh, and this objective can be uh, I'm sorry, optimized using an EM, EM algorithm. So the EM algorithm consists of two steps. The E step, which stands for expectation, has a closed form solution. So uh, we just compute these probabilities, so uh, like just some simple uh, deep, deep net response, then we uh, uh, multiply them together and we normalize them over the, over the bags. And the second step, the maximization step, uh, reduces to the plain and simple binary cross entropy loss minimization. So here uh, we have the deep net response, and here we have uh, values we denote as phi, 
and I call it assume targets. So we invent those over the course of learning. So this is basically just the standard minim minimization of binary cross entropy loss. So here's some kind of diagram that, may, that maybe gives the better picture. So let's say we are given this kind of uh, bag. So there are three instances. Maybe you can tell that this is a cat and these are two dogs, but we are not, we are not provided with that information during training. We are only provided with the number of positives. So in this case, the number of positives is two and it uh, corresponds to the number of dogs in that, in that bag. So uh, using this number, we can determine all the possible labelings for, for this particular bag. And first thing we do is that we feed the instances to our deep network model and we get predictions. So these are probabilities of each instance being a dog. An interesting observation is that, for example, this prediction is already kind of good, so this is really dog. And this prediction is also really kind of good, so this is really a cat, but this one is kind of failing. Nevertheless, when we use this prediction through uh, this formula to uh, recompute the alpha variables, which correspond to probabilities of these individual labelings, we get the highest probability for this labeling. And this actually is the correct labeling because this really is a cat and this really is a dog and this also really, really is a dog. So then we take the alpha variables and we uh, use them to invent these, what I call assumed targets. So then basically we, in, during the M step, we ask the network to fit these targets, meaning we want this prediction to be this target, this prediction to be this target, and this prediction to be this target. So it kind of shows how, how, we, how we drive the network. So it kind of leads the network to the, to the good instance predictions. So basically that's our main result, that's our main algorithm. The downside of the algorithm is that it really works only for small bags because the Poisson distribution due to the number of consistent configuration which grows exponentially with the bag size n it becomes intractable for even you can say moderately sized bags in my ex in my experiments 12 instances per bag is good 13 is way too much so uh, to experiment even with this maybe generalized uh, case we uh, uh, tested this approximated version where we replace the Poisson binomial distribution with a, a normal approximation. And this has a straightforward uh, optimi like there is a straightforward optimization, so you just plug it into a conditional log likelihood and uh, you get this objective which can be easily uh, trained using a gradient descent. And for our experiments, we use two kinds of data sets. Maybe I will focus more on the first one, faces. It consisted of uh, faces extracted from family pictures, as you can see here. So we are given the positions of each face. And for uh, we, we also know which face belongs to females and which, face be uh, which faces belong to males. But for training, we only use the information about the number of women in the picture. So for example here there are three women here so our label would be three. And uh, uh, for our experiments we, we were examining the uh, learning curves. So for example here you can see the validation accuracy for each individual method. So the red curve that's our algorithm that I explain here. The uh, uh, these ones, they, they uh, represent other LLP methods, one of them being our approximated version and two of them being the uh, deep LLP and LLP GAN, which are like, let's say, our competitors. And the uh, orange one is the standard supervised learning, which used the individual instance labels. The LLP methods used only the count-based labels. Uh, what we observed was that our method converged in approximately 50 epochs stably, whereas 
uh, the other LLP methods they required approximately 150 epochs for its for for their convergence, which is like three times more than our. And uh, we also check the the time it takes for because all of these methods are deep learning based, so they process the data sets in epochs. So we measure the time it takes for each uh, each method to finish its training epoch and we found that our method uh, takes way less time than the other LLP methods for both data sets and uh, the reason is that since our method reduces to the standard vanilla binary uh, cross entropy minimization we can use arbitrarily sized batches whereas the uh, other LLP methods, they require the data to be processed uh, in bags. So basically, whatever the bag size is, that is the number of uh, that is the batch size that the LLP methods use. And since we focused really on small bags, you can say like four, as in this case, four, five, something like that. The L the uh, the remaining LLP methods use really small batch sizes whereas we used like 16 or something like that uh, ba basically as big as possible as, as our GPU size uh, permitted so that's how we gain the speed over the remaining LLP methods and you can uh, you can notice that there is some gap between the supervised method and MLE LLP which is our algorithm it coincidentally it is four seconds in both data sets and this gap is caused by the expectation step. So basically, uh, in 16 seconds, four seconds are spent on this recomputation in our Python NumPy implementation. Oh yeah, so I guess these are the main results. So thank you for checking it out. Thank you, gentlemen, for recording it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was talking about class-wise FMMS for knowledge distribution of object detection. And it's very uh, difficult to make a balance between the object detection's uh, accuracy and speed. And uh, Hinton uh, reposed a, a method named the knowledge distillation uh, in 2015 and to uh, improve the accuracy of the simply network. Uh, he used the teacher, teacher model and the student model. 
and the teacher model, which is a, a big uh, object, uh, a big, big, big model, and uh, he used the teacher model's uh, output as self-target and calculate the loss of, of the t uh, software tar target and the student model's output, and uh, uh, to improve the student model's accuracy. But when knowledge distillation uh, used uh, uh, by the one-stage uh, 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 one object detection, uh, there is a problem that uh, uh, it, there, is, there are many uh, repeated bounding box information and uh, background information in uh, teacher's output. So uh, to resolution this problem, Meta used the FMNMS uh, to uh, remove the back, uh, repeated bounding box information. Uh, but the Meta used uh, use, uh, uh, the same uh, focus size to each class. But we think you have to change the uh, cl uh, focus size uh, for each class. Uh, for example, we uh, use uh, uh, for example class A. We use the uh, focus size A, and uh, class B for class B we use the uh, focus size B. So, and uh, the pro process uh, processing of the uh, class wise FM MS is step one. Uh, they term that mine the focus size of each class. And step two, the points uh, with the highest score in the class. Uh, correct bonding to this focus size uh, are extracted. Uh, step three, uh, use the fixture map that uh, extracted in step two as the sub target. Uh, we use this uh, w uh, this method to uh, remove the repeated bonding box information. And for background information, we use the teacher's uh, confidence output to as a weight function and uh, to calculate the loss and to remove the, the background information. Uh, so the processing of the learning is uh, we input, uh, input the image to uh, the teacher model, which have been uh, learned already, and uh, to student model. And we just do uh, class-wise uh, FMMS uh, for teacher model's output. And the output here, we use this one as a self-target and calculate the sub-target and teacher model's output, uh, uh, the loss of the sub-target and uh, uh, student model's output. And uh, the, for the L-heart, is a loss uh, of uh, the ground truth label and uh, student model's output. And for the experiments, we use the data set VOC uh, 2007 and uh, 2012. And uh, the teacher model is Euro V4. The student model is Euro V4 tiny. And for the results, we just improved uh, the MAP, uh, then the Euro uh, student model, Euro V4 tiny. And uh, we improved uh, MAP2, then uh, Meta's uh, method. And uh, we, we, we uh, improved the speed, uh, then Euro, Euro V4 tiny model. Yes, that's all my presentation. I'm so sorry. So nervous. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Maybe I, I, need, I need to do more practice. So I will give my phone to Adam. Adam, can can any one of you play as uh, 
as my guest, so I can explain that to you and not to camera. Would it be nice? So, do, do you have any machine learning background or not uh, at all? A bit, a bit. Okay, okay. I'm a CS student. Okay, that's good, that's good. So, should I start already or? Okay, so what we do is that we actually try to monitor the infestation rates uh, in, the, in the beehives. And uh, as you might know, we have bees. <laughs> right. And overall, we have two different species. Uh, one is Apis serana, and the second one is Apis mellifera. Uh, the first one is called like you know the European and North America bee, and the the other species is you know commonly known as an Asian bee. And uh, then there is third species, which is the varroa mite here, which is a parasite. Uh, and for the Apis mellifera. Uh, you know, they kind of, you know, grow in the same area or developed and they are kind of resistant. But with the global warming and those kind of things, uh, they spread across the globe and they started to, you know, attack the, our European, which at the end is not resistance at all or didn't acquire resistance yet. So we have to care about it. and. Uh, we have to track uh, if the infestation rate in the beehive is, you know, still at the OK level or or not. Um, so, what's the standard practice? The the standard practice uh, at the end is like, you know, manually count them, which is extremely time consuming. And standardly, uh, you know, this is how the hive looks like, and they're like multiple frames in it uh, with, you know, with the comps and everything which might be considered as like, um, I would say trash, it's, you know, dropped down by the bees or thrown down. And at the, at the bottom, there's like a bottom board where everything falls. And this is like a standard picture of, of that bottom board where you can see there's like a lot of stuff. Yeah, you see like, you know, a lot of things you can or we, we say the traces like pollen rim, like vax and those kind of things or even a dead bees uh, and those kind of things in here you might see th this little dot those might be might be the, 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 the mites so they are extremely small and uh, thus uh, if you consider you have like 12 megapixel camera and you have like four times or 4,000 times, 3,000 times, uh, you know, pixels and the size of the Varroa is like 10 times 10 pixels, it's extremely small. So any standard uh, approach, uh, I mean like detection wise, instant segmentation wise or like semantic segmentation wise won't work. We tested that and we reach up to 0.3 of the recall, which is not, uh, you know, what you are looking for. Um, the recall is very important for, uh, or from the, you know, biological or beekeeper's point of view. So we have to, you know, met the recall of at least, you know, 0.9. But as as far as I know, if it's one, that's that's what they what they are looking for. Um, uh, anyway, this is you know application uh, inspired by the beekeepers for for the beekeepers, and you know as the standard methods won't work, uh, we had to you know kind of develop a two-stage approach where we first do like a region of interest detection, uh, where we select some candidates for a varroa mite, and most of the time uh, we reach a recall of one, so we are very close to, to recall that we are expecting and uh, but that goes with the cost we have relatively like high amount of the you know regions so it might be like 1000 or 2000 it really depends on you know the number of things that that are there um, so that's that's the first stage so at the end of the first stage we have like a bunch of you know image cuts with something in the middle and uh, then we do a standard like binary classification uh, which is, you know, kind of visualized in here. Uh, it's super simple. Uh, we tried or used first couple standard mobile uh, architectures 
uh, where we you know measured some kind of uh, performance specificity and uh, you know sensitivity wise and with a very you know a very simple easy approach including like a grid search uh, evolution strategy uh, we developed very small architectures to do the same with the same performance but like hundred times smaller number of parameters um, at the end we ended up with like nine layers three convolutional three pooling three linear and that's 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 the end the good thing is it's fast so the 3000 you know one I think one core standard uh, standard uh, CPU it's like less than one second for 3000 you know samples so so pretty pretty good um, and you know as we do the classification, we can count them and predict, you know, if they are okay or not. At the end, in the system where, you know, the application or the method is in included or integrated, you got like a graph where you can track how many you have over time, okay. how it develops, uh, etc. Uh, so, so that's it. Uh, the good thing or the contribution itself lies in the fact that you don't need any like hardware, just a standard phone, you take a picture and that's it. So, so that's, uh, that's okay. Um, one thing which I should include at the introduction is that most of the time beekeepers are relatively old. They are, you know, over 60 and, you know, their eye is not that sensitive as used to be. So we can kind of, you know, help them by you know just taking a picture and uh, that's it uh, for the sake of people with a low resolution you know sensors we include some kind of a step that do the single image super resolution okay. so even people with like two to four megapixel sensors they are allowed to submit um, you can see the effect how it actually increases and it works with the pre-trained model pretty pretty cool and um, overall we measured different you know uh, different levels of uh, the performance I would say on the data we had to you know kind of evaluate oh so not evaluate uh, to uh, to label ourselves or you know we ask beekeepers to label that but uh, it's it's eventually very time-consuming. Uh, we had different you know test sets and training sets, and we measured uh, you know <laughs> various uh, various things. You know, starting from the classification part through like a seasonal robustness, because you know there is different number of bees in winter and in summer, uh, etc. Uh, and we measured you know how we recognize and confuse different uh, different you know infestation levels uh, itself. And overall, we would say it's like pretty good enough because it's like above 90%. Most of the time, it's like 95 plus. So, so that's that's good. And the like closer investigation revealed that sometimes we are wrong just because we are right because the label noise is present, and that's uh, that's you know most of the time the problem with. Uh, uh, with the data that are kind of fine because imagine you have the bottom board and there is 300 of the, the, the mites and you have to you know kind of label everyone there uh, so that's that's very hard and time consuming <laughs> and that's overall all I don't know if you have any questions <laughs> Not really, but that was a really good thanks thanks <laughs> Come back.
Euh, on peut faire que la même chose euh, qu'avec lui Je t'explique, <rire> je pense que c'est plus simple pour moi. <rire> Merci. Um, uh, so, um, je commence Ok. So, uh, this is a deep learning uh, method, approach, uh, which was applied, uh, applied on, a, um, on a material science uh, problem that was uh, modeled by a morphology preserving absorption model. So I will go into the details of, uh, of each uh, term in the title. So first, um, what we need to know is that um, in uh, material science we have uh, porous materials, which are complex materials that are made of holes, and uh, they are materials we have uh, two faces. We have a solid face and we have a porous face, which is the void. And um, uh, these peop the people of material science are, are, are interested in characterizing these materials. And by uh, characterizing, I mean uh, extracting the textural properties of these materials. So what kind of textural properties can we find in these materials? Um, we can be interested in the pore size distribution, uh, the size of the pores. We can be interested in the surface, specific surface area of pores. We can be interested in the volume of pores, etc. So this kind of information. So basically, uh, what happens in the labs, uh, experimental lab, we have a real uh, sample of uh, pores material, and we have an experimental technique many experimental techniques, one of them, which is called the uh, gas absorption, allows us to obtain a curve like this. And from these curves, we can extract these properties. So uh, we have done uh, before a morphological uh, preserving absorption model, which transforms this, uh, simulate this experimental technique by means of um, morphological and geometrical parameters only. So without going into the physics, in this work we have uh, used correlations between uh, morphological parameters and physical parameters to transform the problem into something that we can deal with only uh, with, uh, with um, morphological parameters. Right? So all of that uh, doesn't exist in the, in the poster, it's just the background. And um, one, one, one drawback of uh, this morphology preserving absorption model is that it, uh, it can be heavy uh, in terms of, uh, in term of uh, computation time uh, because it's based on uh, many morphological uh, operations. We have two morphological operators, the adsorption morphological operators and the desorption morphological operator. And each one of uh, uh, these operators is uh, based on, um, on uh, classical operators such as the dilation, uh, the uh, morphological closing, etc. And so each operator is, uh, has a linear time complexity. So for a volume, it depends on the, the size of this volume. And uh, this linear time complexity can be a problem when we have big volumes. Uh, and in these big volumes, when we have uh, big pores, uh, the biggest porosity, many voids, uh, let's say we have a pore of radius uh, 100 voxel. Uh, in this case, we will have 100 iteration. So 100 iteration of uh, linear complexity depending on the time. So, for this case, we can go uh, at least, uh, we can have at least a competition time of 15 minutes, but if we have very big ports, we can go to several hours, which is not practical and we cannot, um, uh, not practical to use our model in this case. So one way to go around this problem is to transform it another time from the physical to morphological and now from the morphological to something that can be adaptable to CNN, to convolutional neural networks. And um, for that, the first uh, thing uh, is to transform the morphological data, the, our calculations uh, here, to uh, a volume, which we have called uh, the adsorption map. And then in this adsorption map, uh, it's grayscale. We have different uh, pixels with different uh, grayscale um, values. Uh, it contains all the morphological data that is necessary um, to extract the adsorption curve. So we have a objective relationship between the adsorption curve and the adsorption, uh, the adsorption map, sorry, and the adsorption curve, and uh, it's only uh, uh, um, uh, we only store the data in terms of uh, volumes. That's it. And so in this in this way, we have volumes that contains the data. We have the inputs. We have the output. So we can we have something that can that is adaptable to CNN. Now, since we uh, what interested. What interests us in this kind of microstructures is also the, the, um, the tortuosity, the topology of the microstructure. 
we really need to keep the 3D volume of the microstructure. We can't have a 2D CNN uh, and, and train it on, uh, just on, uh, on, uh, on slices because we will lose all the 3D information. And for that, we have two possibilities. Either we use a 3D CNN, convolutional neural network, and in this case, uh, 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 we, will need, uh, we will need a specific hardware because uh, imagine for a certain uh, batch size, uh, we, if we have big volumes uh, of microstructures, we, it will require a big memory for sprints and it will not, uh, it's not feasible in our case. And we want to run it on a simple laptop. Uh, so for this case, we have uh, thought of a trick to uh, capture the 3D information into 2D slices. So how we do that? So this is uh, an example of a uh, toy case uh, to, to, exp to e explain this idea. So we have a BCC unit cell. So two phases, uh, the, the black phase, uh, let's say, it's, it's the, the space of uh, the subspace uh, of feature elements. And uh, the yellow uh, is the subspace of non-feature elements. So if we apply the distance transform, a 2D distance transform to the front slice of this volume, uh, we will have something like this because the distance transform, what typically does is it replaces the pixel of uh, the non-feature elements, the void face, uh, by its distance to the closest uh, feature elements. So we'll have something like this. Imagine this is a front slice. We will, we will not see uh, the, the, the sphere, the, the big sphere in the background. And so the, the biggest uh, distance will be uh, in the center of, the, of, the, of the, the, the slice. Now, the problem with this 2D approach is that we lose the information about, uh, about the 3D uh, configuration of the microstructure. Now, for, on the other hand, if here we have uh, a 3D distance transform, so we have uh, a 3D distance transform of the whole microstructure and we take just the slice. So by having just a slice of this, uh, micro, of this uh, object, let's say, we can say that there is an object, a hidden object, which is very close to the center. In this case, it, it, it does not become the, the, the farthest element, <laughs> but in this case, these elements are the farthest elements from, from, uh, from the feature, uh, from the space. And here, the farthest element was 40 pixels away, but here is only 20, okay? <coughs> so this is the trick that we want to try. And uh, for that, we want to train our neural network on uh, Boolean models of microstructures. Boolean models, they are based on uh, their one scale porosity. And they are, they, are, they, are, they are constructed by using the um, Poisson points uh, process. Uh, Poisson points process. So to uh, have a data set that is uh, representative, we use different quantities of uh, the white objects, which are the platelets, which model the solid, and different sizes. So we have these volumes. We enrich this volume. We apply the 3D distance transform to these volumes. This is a pre-processing step. And then we slice, we take slices of each volume. And this constitutes our data set. Now, the important thing about it is that we only do the training on 2D slices, but every slice contains the 3D information that, yes, that was given to it by the 3D information, <coughs> by the 3D uh, distance transform. So for the neural network, it's a classical encoder-decoder architecture. Uh, we have tuned it a bit with uh, dense uh, convolutional blocks to fit forward, um, to, to reuse features and to minimize the number of parameters. We have an upsampling uh, which was achieved by the depth to space uh, subpixel convolution. And uh, we use a perceptual loss function, which is this SSEM. Uh, because we are more interested in capturing the details, the, the variation or the, the differences between the pixel intensities um, on a structural level, not on the pixel level. So I explained this part. Now on the results, uh, I have many results in the paper, but uh, here are the most important things, I guess. We have the ground truth, uh, which is of this microstructure. This is the adsorption map, and this adsorption map produces the adsorption curve, which is on, with the blue. And this is the adsorption, the predicted adsorption map with no 3D distance transform. And this is the adsorption map with using the distance transform. And by comparing qualitatively, visually, the, the ground truth with the no distance transform, with the distance transform, we see that the, the, the results given by the no distance transform is, is, uh, 
is poor because we cannot, uh, we don't capture the, 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 the size, the true sizes. We just normalize over, uh, homogenize uh, over the neighborhood and the result is not satisfa satisfactory. And so this confirms that the 3D information is, uh, is really transferred by, uh, by, uh, by using the 3D distance map into slices. And we were, uh, we, 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 we have this, um, this result by using only uh, 2D uh, CNN. Uh, and th this is one of the, 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 the most important results in, in this paper. So this is what uh, interests us by the end, which is the adsorption curve, which is in uh, very good fit with uh, the ground truth. The conclusion, uh, conclusions is first, we have a 2D pure scheme but we capture 3D information. We have a tailored architecture that we have called at this net and in the paper we have compared it with UNet++. The speed, uh, this is uh, also one of the most important things. I said before it requires uh, from 50 minutes to uh, more for a 5 uh, 12 uh, cubic cell. Well in this case it only uh, depends on the size of the, of the, of the volume which, and it's only the, the, the inference time required for, for that volume, which in our case uh, was uh, one minute and a half. And uh, we only need a post-processing step, uh, which uh, brings us from here to here, which require one minute or something like this, because all the calculations were done, were, were predicted. And of course, uh, we have validated our model on a more complex model than the model that, we're, uh, that we have uh, trained on which is a Cox model, which is a two-scale porosity, and uh, the training data was uh, only a Boolean model. And, uh, you have any questions? Uh, uh, no, but that was really good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your explanation. It's clear for me. Thank you.